Welcome everyone to this online program of the American Writers Museum. We're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American, of American writing. The idea of American writing encompasses so many different types of word work working in so many different parts of the country. And we're here tonight in partnership with the Western Writers of America to celebrate the best writing of the American West. Joining us are four of the most recent winners of the WWA's Spur Awards, which honor fiction, nonfiction, poetry, song, drama, and documentary writing about the West. We're honored tonight to welcome them. David Hesko Wanbley Wyden, an enrolled citizen of the Sichangu Lakota Nation, is author of the novel Winter Counts and the children's book Spotted Tail, a biography of the great Lakota leader. That book was the winner of the 2020 Spur Award. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Yellow Medicine Review, and many other publications. Johnny Boggs has won a record nine Spur Awards from the writer, Western Writers of America for his fiction, and his work spans nonfiction, sports writing, journalism, and short stories. He's the editor of Roundup Magazine. Kathleen O'Neill Gear has more than 200 nonfiction publications in the fields of archaeology, history, and bison conservation, and has authored or co authored 47 international bestsellers. She's received numerous awards, both for her writing and for her work as an archaeologist. And Michael Gear has published or is in the process of publishing 20 novels under his own name and authored another 37 with Kathleen. Michael's latest original novel is The Alpha Enigma. I'm going to bring them into the room with all of us. Hello. Hello, Allison. Thank you so much for being here. I, I understand that you've each selected something different to read to us tonight, and we're eager to hear what you have to share. And I was wondering, David, if you would start. Well, I would. And I just want to thank you so much for the invitation and say what an honor it is to be here on the virtual stage with these folks who truly are some of the giants of Western literature. And I'll point out that this reading tonight is my sole uh, tour for the paperback version of Winter Counts, which came out last week. So Winter Counts just released, and this is it. This is the tour. So Congratulations. I, yeah, so I'm very honored. And all of these folks were at, we were all just together at the Western Writers of America Conference, where I was fortunate enough to be awarded Best Novel, Best Contemporary Novel for Winter Counts. So I'll read just a page or two of Winter Counts. I'll give a quick setup. Winter Counts is a literary thriller set on the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. I am a citizen of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe, known in our language as the Sichangu Lakota Nation. And it's a story of a hired vigilante, Virgil Wounded Horse, who goes out and gets street justice when the US government and or the tribal council will not act. And the book is really an examination of the broken criminal justice system on reservations. I'll read a short non-profane passage. I had to work quite hard to find uh, uh, some pages that didn't have any swear words, um, So, but I was able to accomplish that. So I will uh, set this up. Uh, in the book, Virgil Wounded Horse is hired to stop uh, heroin from being brought on to the Rosebud Indian Reservation. His own nephew, who, of whom he's a guardian, has an overdose and on heroin. And in this scene, which is very short, just a couple of pages, Virgil Wounded Horse is in the hospital waiting to find out if his beloved nephew, Nathan, will live or die. So it's told in the voice of Virgil Wounded Horse, and he's pondering his life and where he fits in and his nephew, Nathan. So here is a couple of pages from chapter six of Winter Counts. The window in the hospital room was murky like it hadn't been washed in years. But I could still glimpse the russet, russet hills and rolling prairie of the reservation outside in the dying light. Back in the time before Columbus, there were only Indians here, no skyscrapers, no automobiles, no streets. Of course, we didn't use the words Indian or Native American back then. We were just people. We didn't know we were supposedly drunks or lazy or savages. I wondered what it was like to live without that weight on your shoulders, the weight of the murdered ancestors, the stolen land, the abused children, the burden every native person carries. We were told in movies and books that natives 
had a sacred relationship with the land that we worshiped and nurtured it. But staring at Nathan, I didn't feel any mystical bond with the res. I hated our crappy unpaved roads and our falling down houses and the snarling packs of dogs that roamed freely in the streets and alleys. But most of all, I hated that kids like Nathan, good kids, decent kids, got involved with drugs and crime and gangs because there was nothing for them to do here. No after school jobs, no clubs, no tennis lesson. Every month in the Lakota Times newspaper, there was an obituary for another teen suicide, another family in the Burn Fi Nation who'd had their heart taken away from them. In the old days, the Ayapaha was the town crier, the person who would meet incoming warriors after a battle, ask them what happened so they wouldn't have to speak of their own glories, and then tell people the news. Now, the Ayapaha our local newspaper announced losses and harms too often, victories and triumphs too rarely. Why didn't I leave? People here on the res always talked about going to Rapid City or Sioux Falls or Denver, getting a job and making a clean break, putting aside native ways and assimilating, adapting to suburban life. But I thought about the sound of the drummers at a powwow the smell of wild sage, the way little native kids looked dressed up in their first regalia, the flash of the sun coming up over the hills. I wondered if I could ever really leave the reservation because the res was in my mind, a virtual res, one that I was seemingly stuck with. And then I fell into a half sleep, immersed in fugue dreams and transient thoughts, images of Indian children dancing in my head. Johnny, would you like to uh, to go next? Follow that? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> uh, what David didn't say was that he also was just awarded best first novel from international thriller writers. So I'll give him a plug there. And it's a, it's a fantastic read, David. It's just absolutely phenomenal. So uh, this is from the book that just won the Spur Award for best mass market paperback novel. It's called A Thousand Texas uh, Longhorns. And, and this is just about two union veterans um, sitting in a coffee shop who are bored out of their mind. The potatoes on John Catlin's plate were cold. Same with the gravy, even the beef. The waitress at the Laporte Dining Palace refreshed his coffee and moved on. Catlin broke the dam of mashed potatoes with a spoon, but no waterfall broke free. No flood of brown drenched his beef, or the gravy had congealed, which didn't surprise him. For at least 15 minutes, he had just stared at the food. Chair legs scraped the floor as Steve Grover sat, uninvited, holding his own cup of coffee. Sipping, Grover shook out a copy of Daily State Sentinel. Catlin looked across a small cafe. Palace was a misnomer to see if he knew anyone else in the restaurant. He hadn't thought to look when he first sat down, but unless someone was hiding, Grover and Catlin were the only ones here. No, there was a gent with a silk hat by the table near the window that looked out onto the alley, spooning lemon cake. How long you been here? Catlin asked. Just got here, got a cup of water, dyed with coffee. You were so focused on your chow, you didn't even hear me say afternoon, Captain. Oh, Catlin eyed his food. Grover studied the newspaper. At $2 a year, Grover said, a man would think there'd be something worth reading. You subscribe to an Indianapolis newspaper? No, he turned the page. Found it on a bench outside of Marston's. You getting a photograph or Ambro type taken? Neither, Grover flipped to another page. Just walking past, he's closed on Sundays anyhow. He peered over the top of the paper. You ever get a likeness made of yourself? Catlin nodded, Indianapolis before we marched south. Tenta. Mailed one? No, it must have been two to Mon Pond, Michigan. I got four. Must have kept one for myself. Don't know what I did with the other. How much did that cost? He shrugged. Two bits, four, dollar. Don't rightly recall. Grover returned to the newspaper, went to another page, looked at Callum again. How'd you know it was an Indianapolis newspaper? I left it on the bench outside of Wallace's grocery house. You subscribe to the Sentinel? No, I found it in the trash box outside of Culver's. You buying a book or crockery, Grover asked. Where? At Culver's. No, he's closed too, it being Sunday. I just looked down by chance, saw it, picked it up. Wonder how it got all the way up here. 
The paper, I mean. Drummer, I warrant. Most likely. Wonder how it got from Culver's to Marston's. That's a mystery for sure. Catlin looked at his plate, sighed. You don't read the Herald? Charlie Powell don't put nothing in his paper except advertisements for blood pills. You? Catlin was too late trying to cover his yawn. Excuse me. I'll pick up one now and then when I find one at the grocery or Culver store. How'd your winter wheat make out? Slim, yours, about the same. Spring wheat was average, mine too. Figure this spring will be better. Catlin nodded. If we get some decent rain, silence. Come to church? Got here too late. You? I just got here. A month or maybe just a minute passed. Well, I know why you left this on the bench. Nothing worth reading in Indianapolis either. There's always something worth reading, Catlin said. What? Sign. Catlin took the paper, turned to the second page, and tapped at the quotation below the paper's name and the date. The Union. It must be preserved. Jackson. Grover nodded, took the paper, and slid it to the side of the table. Catlin plowed the potatoes with a sport. Preparation, he figured, for spring. If spring ever returned, Grover slurped. Cat and farm mashed potatoes, the gravy hardened, the waitress walked by without checking on either. Catlin thought about tasting the meal he paid for and decided against it. Ran into Mrs. Yoho at Oliver's yesterday, Grover said. How's she doing? Got the guitar? I see. Getting better. There are remedies. Grover tapped the papers. Papers are full of advertisements for cures, especially in Charlie's Herald. Last time I saw a copy, anyhow. They grin. Sip coffee, which still wasn't good. Catlin wondered how his dinner would taste if he'd bothered to eat. Then again, he knew how it tasted. Hell, that's all anyone ate here whenever they come to town to splurge on a meal, something they didn't have to cook themselves. And when they ate at home, this is the same blessed meal they'd cook. He asked if I'd speak to the unconditional union girls of Laporte, Grover said. Who? Mrs. Yoho. Catlin had to reconnoiter to figure out where Mrs. Yoho came into the conversation. Speak about what? He asked after a moment. Grover smiled and tapped the, and the folded newspaper. How I preserved the union. Oh, Catlin wondered if the beef might be halfway decent. I got asked to speak once. To the unconditional union girls? Catlin shook his head. St. Rose's Academy. What'd you say? Nothing. I told the headmistress they asked me another time after the wheat crop was in. The clock ticked. The waitress stared at them long and hard before she turned another page in some yellow covered novel. I meant to unplug that. <laughs> well, Callan Stretch, guess it's about that time. Yeah, getting late. Yeah, ought to get my wagon, head back to home. Yeah, might come a good snow. <laughs> Moisture would help. They waited. We did it though, didn't we, Grover said. What's that? Grover punched at the newspaper. The Union, it must be preserved. We sure preserved her. Catlin nodded. He made himself stand, otherwise they might be here till the century turned. The witness looked, looked the other, their other way, their way, relief washing over her face. Catlin found his watch in his vest packet, pocket, checked the time, sighed. You know what I tell him? A sadness filled Steve Grover's eyes. Tell who? The unconditional union girls. Oh, Callan said. What? I tell those ladies this. I never know how gall darn boring Indiana was till I went off to war. I'm going to read first, Allison. Um, this is from a book that came out about a month ago called The Ice Lion. And the leading character who's speaking here is Lynx. He's a 16-year-old member of the Sea Lion people. A faint pink gleam lightens the sable sky and drowns the campfires of the dead as serenely as though the world has not changed. I move each branch aside with a bloody hand before quietly stepping past and continuing along the game trail that circles our camp. My hearing and memory are gone. I keep staring at the drag marks, wondering what caused them. The dark swaths lead from the camp out into the towering pine forest. Though I can feel my leather boots crunching snow and old pine needles, I can't hear them. The wind-blown trees rock without sound. Up in the branches, birds cock their heads and seem to be watching something back in the deepest shadows. What's back there? All I see are black shapes floating between the trees as though not quite real. 
just odd ghosts going about their morning duties. Walk, keep walking. Deep inside, I know it isn't supposed to be this way. You work hard, learn everything you can, prove you can protect a wife and family. Then as soon as a girl passes her first blood moon, you are granted the right to marry. When you die, it's many summers later, surrounded by children and grandchildren. Not this reaching, not this struggling to grasp your heart and stop it from slamming inside your chest. By the time I circle around again, how many times have I circled? The light is brighter, the camp clearer. The heap of coals in the fire flash red when the wind gusts. The side at mammoth hides lie in shreds and near them two packs. Both have been ripped open and the contents strewn around. There's a spear in the grass. Painted yellow diamonds decorate the shaft. It's familiar. Is it my spear? How did it get there? Did I throw it down and run? No, not again. I should go pick it up, but I'm afraid to walk into the open with the yellow eyes watching me. I don't always see them, but sometimes they gleam, tracking my movements. Why can't I hear them? Twigs must be snapping as the animals reset either, resettle their heavy bodies around the kills. If only I'd gone blind instead of deaf. I long not to see, but I can't close my eyes. These are my last moments. I must watch them pass, need to. As if somehow the very turning of the seasons depends upon seeing my breath cross the air until the very end. When I stop and brace my shaking knees, my blood-soaked pants feel stiff. Am I hurt? I feel no pain, only a stunned tingling that makes it impossible to think. How long ago was our camp attacked? Moments? Days? The temperature tells me it might be early autumn. As father's sun crests the eastern horizon, the morning warms imperceptibly, and bars and streaks of pale gold puncture the shadows and leave them dying on the forest floor. I seem to be falling through emptiness at the end of time, and I can see the bottom rising up to meet me. Nonsensically, I blink at the ice giants, their bodies spread across the horizon for as far as I can see, wrinkling it like a colossal blue-white blanket, creased with the shadows of valleys and dotted with trees. There's a a story the elders tell about how the ancient Gemin tried to fight the ice giants by casting a necklace studded with gigantic mirrors into the sky to melt them. Where am I? What's my clan? I can't even remember the name of my village. My only recollections are of rustlings in the grass and the thumps and arms and legs being dragged between tree trunks. How many lions are out there? Lightheaded, I walk out into the meadow. On the way, I pull the spear from the grass and clutch it hard as I head for the campfire. Where are the guards? There are always wedding camp guards. Crouching before the smoldering fire, I tug a branch from the wood pile we gathered at dusk and place it on top of the coals. Flames lick through the tender and the scent of burning pine perfumes the air. I keep adding more and more wood, building up the fire until fantastic flame shadows leap through the dawn trees. Then I wait for the yellow eyes to come. What's her name? The woman, I, I remember some things, small things. Long before we met, I knew about her by sight and notoriety. I'd watched her dancing with several men, her slender body and long arms weaving in the firelight ritual feasts. Her beautiful face, the deep bevel of her nose and those translucent brown eyes had affected me like a spirit plant rampaging through my veins. Siskin had haunted me until I'd won her love. Leaping to my feet, I whirl around, searching for her. Siskin, where are you? Like a slap, my hearing returns. When the roar of lions and human whimpers eddy through the trees, my knees fail. I sit down hard and stare at the fire until nothing exists except the fluttering orange glow. No trees, no boulders, no cries for help. It's like living inside flame glow. For a long time, I studied the swarms of sparks rising into the clear air. Far down the mountainside, waves roll toward a distant shore. I must get home, tell some, tell them something. Rising on shaking legs, I run. The almost soundless padding of giant paws under it seems time to my heartbeat. There are no contradictions now, no future, no past. 
I run suspended between despair and ecstasy. Here in the single instant is the totality of every lesson I've ever learned, every desire I've ever felt. Nothing means anything. All the guilt for the things I've done wrong and never accomplished evaporates with the sound of the panting behind me. I do wonder why I was ever born. What was the purpose? I've barely lived my life. 16 short summers, what was it all for? Clutching my spear in my shaking fist, I pound through the grass. The beat of paws picks up, loping along. At the edge of my vision, tan fur appears and disappears amid the dense weave of the forest. A slow lope. There's no need to rush. The lions know I can't outrun them. Thank you. Mike, would you like to uh, finish us off the reading portion of the of the event? Yep. We always save the worst for last. <laughs> this comes from uh, the scorched earth. I worked on this novel for 30 years. I uh, had agents that said, well, we won't represent it because it's no one is into to big historical Civil War Western novels. Um, and over the years, I would rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And finally, sold it to Tom Doherty at, at Tor Forge over supper one night in New York and finally got to see it come to life. Um, I'm going to, to read a little bit out of chapter 13 uh, in the, the story. Butler Hancock is, is a lieutenant in the Confederate Army. Uh, he didn't really, he, he's a um, abolitionist from Northwestern Arkansas. And there were a lot of abolitionists in Northwestern Arkansas. They all joined the, the Confederate Army because they supported their state and supported secession. And this is early in the book. This is the, the retreat. Uh, the Confederates have been surrounded in Kentucky and have retreated to Nashville. And of course, the, the city is indefensible. And Butler is getting his first taste of the war. He's in Nashville. Here and there, structures burned. Sparks and smoke shot into the sky. Furtive groups of sculptors, looted stores and residents. Women shrieked and pleaded, some groveling before drunken men who carried off household furnishings. On a street corner, a lunatic laughed maniacally, a whiskey bottle dangling from his hand, his face reflecting crazy relief at the sight of the troops. The arrival of Hardy's half-frozen, sick and dispirited men only added to the intensity of defeat. At the sight of them, even more people picked up and joined the ragged columns of refugees that clogged the roads out of town. But most striking, the image Butler would carry away was the terror in the children's eyes. Their pale faces, tear streaked, gaping mouths like black holes. This was the stuff of nightmares, the literature of disaster come to life, like Euripides would have penned in the Trojan women, the sack of Rome the raising of Carthage, or Napoleon at Moscow. In a daze, he rode through the streets, his pistol in his hand for protection. He kept asking himself, am I really seeing this? He rode south on the Murfreesboro Pike. He tried not to think of the cries and dismay expressed in the remaining terror-crazed citizens of Tennessee's one-time capital on the Cumberland. What was war, anyway? He wanted to cry for the poor people, the broken and terrified, fleeing into the cold, the rain, and the mud as the Yankee horde swept down from the north. It was the children, the women, the frightened families, many of them without comfort of men, that speared his heart, nor did it let up. Wagons clogged the road, loaded as they were with the treasures of a lifetime. They still couldn't come close to evacuating the tens of tons of provisions left behind for forest cavalry to burn and destroy before the pursuing said Federals could seize them. Had Butler not been there to see for himself as Confederate troops fought with lawless civilians, he would have never believed such madness could be occurring in an American city. And then came the final look over the shoulder as Hardy's small army marched south on the Murfreesboro Pike. Columns of smoke rose into the sullen sky as warehouses were set fire, 
Steamboats still under construction were immolated in their, in their docks and military stores were put to the torch to deny their use to mules pursuing Federals. This part of war, Butler hadn't imagined. Your thoughts, Lieutenant, Colonel Daniel Govan asked. Govan had raised a company of Phillips County men from around Helena, had been promoted to regimental commander in the wake of Hinman's promotion to Brigadier General. In the reorganization and integration of the Army of Central Kentucky, the 2nd Arkansas had been placed in the Liddell's Brigade, 3rd Division, Hardy's Corps. I was thinking I can't have seen the things I've seen. Was that really Nashville? I mean, that might have been Moscow on even Napoleon's advance, or perhaps Rome as the barbarian vanguard approached, not our Nashville. He glanced at the line of chained slaves who rested at the side of the road. If the price of secession, he thought, is the abolition of slavery, let them go, each and every last one. Colonel Govan now walked his gelding beside Butler Sorrel, their pace set by the infantry and the overloaded wagons thronging the pike. The column seemed to proceed like some huge antediluvian serpent as it flowed unbroken over hill and field. Here and there, exhausted civilians waited off the side of the road, huddled under blankets, cold, shivering, their meager possessions piled around them. When they met Butler's gaze, it was with hopelessness and hollow eyes. They might have been wraiths instead of corporeal beings, images whose reality faded from the moment they were out of sight. Interspersed among them were more lines of slaves, driven south by mounted overseers who rode with shotguns over their saddlebows. Human wealth, suffering in the cold and for lack of food. Many marched shackled and chained, a sight that sent a spirit of pain through Butler's soul. Is this what I'm fighting for? With each step, the horses splashed, hooves sucking as they pulled from the mud, the wet creak of leather, the snuffle of tied horses, and the occasional shouts carried on the chill air. Butler was assailed by a curious scent of unwashed human, mixed with wet wool, mud, manure, and horse flesh. It almost overwhelmed when the breeze changed quarter. It defies imagination. Americans acting like vandals. Butler wondered as he raised his right hand and made a fist. As he squeezed, water dribbled out of the saturated glove. Then he shifted to his reins. We saw it, Lieutenant. Sort of like some drunken nightmare, Govan glanced up at the bruised sky. Except I haven't woke from it yet. Just past the stone walls lining the sunken road, the county was gray and barren. Winter bare trees lined the fallow tobacco and cornfields before surrendering to thick stands of forest that blocked the horizon. Occasional cabins and barns were set back from the road, all looking abandoned. Word was that the locals had removed themselves and most of all their livestock from any possible depredations of passing army or the horde of refugees. Seems like a damn shame. Thank you so much. And thank you to, to all of you for, for sharing those words with us. I wanted to, I have a few questions. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about writing and then um, I'm going to take, we're gonna take some questions from the audience. So just a, a quick reminder for folks, if you have a question, type it into the Q and A box that's in the middle of the bottom of your screen there. And I'm checking on that. And so we're gonna take a few of those questions. The four of you write so many different things. And, and so you, there, there was far more in all of your careers than I could possibly fit into, a, into an introduction. Um, but I wanted to ask, you're all, you've all been honored for work that centers the American West. So I wanted to ask each of you, what does that mean to you to, to center the West in your work and how do you do that? I'll, I'll answer first if it's okay. Please. Uh, the West, for me, is about facing the challenges of a frontier. And we often define the West as a time period or a place. And I'm not sure that's accurate. Because I think facing the frontier transcends time and space. And just as an example, a passage I just read you, which sounds like a prehistory book from the Iceland, 
is a science fiction novel, but it's about the West a thousand years from now. And it's still about facing challenges and trying to survive. I guess I can go a little bit. Um, you know, for me, obviously, writing about the West means centering the Native American experience. You know, for generations, Natives were not, Native Americans were not included in the literature of the West. Or if we were, it was as savages, people to be defeated. But I would say, obviously, the organization, the Western Writers of America, as well as American Liter in general, has, literature in general, has, has really begun to include you know, natives in, in this literature. And so for me, the experience of the West means writing about natives, not in a stereotypical way, but trying to explain who we are. We're still here. We're, we're not gone. And, and, but, you know, the story of the West for natives was obviously the loss of our lands, the theft of our lands, the genocide of our people, you know, by the American government. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at the Carlisle Indian School, the first residential Indian school in Pennsylvania, where my grandmother was a student. And I saw this stone prison that they used to lock up five and six year old children. Um, so for us, you know, for Native Americans, it, the story of the West is really just really the loss of our lands and trying to figure out where we fit into this new landscape. Johnny, did you want to add to yes, that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, I came from a different background. I mean, most of these are, are Westerners. I'm actually from South Carolina and uh, just grew up in swamps and, and um, tobacco fields. And the West for me was on television and um, movies and it was far away from what I was growing up with. So that, that was my fascination. But when I went into journalism and I was working in newspapers in Texas, um, you realize that uh, it's a whole different, it's, it's totally different. And it's much like David was saying, I, I didn't want to write about the cliches, the stereotypes. I didn't want to write about, you know, gunfighters coming in and, and saving the ranch and things like that. I want to write more, um, more realistic fiction and, uh, and, and go for that. And I always thought most of the West uh, and most of Western history, it's really a, a uh, not white hats and black hats, but it's people with strong opinions of what is right and what's wrong. And those opinions often clash. And that's why we got out in the West. That's pretty much the history of the entire country, I believe, unfortunately. So um, that was my, my feelings on, on why, what, what drove me to write about the West was that. The other thing was when I started out writing, I was writing short fiction for you know, small publications. And I was writing a lot of autobiographical Southern um, pieces, and I made the mistake of mailing one home. And um, after hearing my parents and siblings talk, I realized if you want to get invited back for Christmas dinner, you might want to start disguising your fiction a little bit better. So that's what I. <laughs> I guess to, to, to round all of this out, uh, I'm a fourth generation Colorado kid. And so I, this is the land that I grew up with. And then of course, working as, as an archeologist all through the, the Rocky Mountain West and the Great Plains, my idea of the West is entirely different because we grew up with this, this notion that everything started in 1492 when the first boat got here. And for me, going out and locating and excavating these sites that go back to 15,000 years, where there's an awful lot of people who have been in Wyoming and Colorado and Utah, and the, the cultures that flourished here, you know, Kathleen and I are best known for doing the people books, which are about the true settling and development of civilization in North America. And it happened long, long before 1492. Who were the, who were some of the, the historical writers in both in, in, in Western writers and, you know, writers in general who, who influenced you when you, um, you know, when you began to write yourselves? Uh, in Scott Momaday, Way to Rainy Mountain, Elmer Kelton's many books, um, Gone with the Wind, Margaret Mitchell. And, and for me, Western writers, I, I grew up on Zane Gray. We have an entire collection of, of Louis L'Amour. And then yeah, 
of course, there were always problems with that because it didn't square with with what you learn as a historian. And yeah, the, the whole gunfighter night of the range sort of thing. But yeah, I just read prodigiously in all genres. Well, I can go quickly. Oh, oh, did I? Did I, I didn't cut you off, did I, Johnny? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll go. Um, these folks already heard uh, my speech, but for me, Larry McMurtry was the writer that influenced me the most. And at the Western Writers America conference a few weeks ago, I dedicated the award for best contemporary novel to Mr. McMurtry, who sadly just passed on. But for me, Larry McMurtry, especially with his magisterial book, Lonesome Dove, showed what can be done with the Western. He redefined, he reconceptualized the Western. And he also showed that that what we sometimes dismissively call genre literature is just literature. It's just literature that has big themes and big ideas and great stories. And so for me, I've been a Larry McMurtry fan long before Lonesome Dove and uh, what a loss to the world of letters. Indeed, indeed. And, and, when, and working in, in Texas and the newspapers, one thing was required reading was every Larry McMurtry book that came out. You had to read it all the time. Uh, and yeah, I, mean, I think I think Horseman Passed By and The Last Picture Show are two just beautiful, beautiful books. And they're set in, the, in what the modern West in the 1950s. Uh, so I thought those were, were just great literature. Um, uh, A.B. Guthrie Jr. Uh, and I remember um, I was in college and I walked across from my dorm into a bookstore and there was a paperback by Dorothy M. Johnson called The Hanging Tree and Other Stories. And Dorothy M. Johnson wrote a number of short stories that three movies, uh, The Hanging Tree, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, and ooh, I'm drawing a blank on another. Uh, but um, she, she was just, I, I picked up this, this book, uh, went back to my room and started reading it. And, you know, I, in South Carolina, what you found were usually um, Louis L'Amour novels and, and maybe a Zane, my dad once gave me a Zane Gray novel. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike, but I read through the Zane Gray novel and, and I'm like, man, this is just, this is just ponderous. I mean, the, the description of the land's beautiful, but the dialogue just sucks. <laughs> but Dorothy M. Johnson just transformed me because they were, it was literate. It wasn't good guys and bad guys. Some of them were really funny. And I just said, you know, that's what I—that's who I want to be. I want to be Dorothy M. Johnson. Um, I never succeeded, but uh, I keep trying. I have to have a ranch in Montana. <laughs> You've all done, you know, so so much work in in so many different forms, and so I wanted to ask you what your writing process is like, and how that process has changed for you over the course of your careers. I always start. Somebody else has to go. <laughs> um, I was working at a newspaper and I was, you know, I think a lot of newspaper journalists, they, their, their goal is to become a, a, a writer of novels. And, and few of them ever actually, uh, I mean, C.J. Box, uh, Tony Hillerman, you know, it can be done. And that, that was my dream. I mean, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I also knew I needed to make a living. I thought that trying to be a sports writer or sports uh, assistant sports editor is a good way to make a living. But that's what started out. And I was writing on the side. I was, you know, doing this short stories and stuff like that. And I, I started writing a novel. And I finished the novel in like three and a half years. And then I tried to sell it for about three years. Eventually, I did sell or My agent eventually sold it. But I also realized, you know what? Um, if it's taken you three and a half years to write a novel that most people can finish in a year, you need to just start down and focusing on that. So that's when I started focusing and I started, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. And, and it turned out okay. I mean, I started selling some books and eventually quit the newspaper job and I've been doing this full time for 23 years. Uh, there, there's one nice, I mean, I write from an outline, it's a loose outline. Uh, I get the idea first. I say, I tell people, you know, I'm still a journalist. But instead of asking the questions, who, what, where, when, why, I ask what if, and then let the imagination go. And the, the, the thing I do miss, though, is when, you, when, I, when I had the steady income and I was just writing for myself, you know, it wasn't quite the pressure. And if I got stuck on a project, I could, I could let go and go on to something else. 
you know, I'm under contract now and the editors are expecting a book at such and such date. And if I get stuck, I got to figure out a way to work through it. And uh, um, John Jakes once told me, you know, books can be like your children. You love them all, but sometimes they might not quite turn out the way you hoped. <laughs> all right, I went first. <laughs> all right, I'll go second. Um, go ahead. It's, I guess my, my writing style has, has changed over the decades. Um, currently, uh, Kathleen calls it vomit and mop. And so what I try and do is, is you get into the, to the flow of the story and it doesn't matter. Get it down. And you know, there are days when I'll come up, be really happy with myself for having done like 25 pages. And then I have to go back and spend two and a half weeks cleaning it all up and turning it into like real English and realizing that every adjective is not red. So that's, that's pretty much it. And it, it changes depending upon which genre we're writing in. If we're writing in prehistory, there's a lot of research. I mean, we're having to go from uh, anthropological reports, monographs, uh, pollen analysis, uh, climatic reconstructions, and, and just all kinds of things. And then weaving that in versus if, if we're doing a, a modern historical like dissolution, uh, that's, this is what we live every day. So it, it goes a lot faster. David. I'll, I'll, I'll go. So you don't have to. Yeah. So you can go last for once. Well, I'm really the, the, the wrong person to ask for this question because I'm the, the rookie of this group. You know, I've got my, I have a scholarly book out and a children's book. But this is my first real novel, so I, I don't know that I have a great answer to this question, but like Johnny said, I am under contract with HarperCollins for my next book, and they want that manuscript uh, quite badly, and so if there are any writers out there, I will tell you what I've done to try and speed up my writing process is I do outline now, and specifically I create what's called a beat sheet. So if folks have read uh, this book, it's a screenwriting book called Save, Save the Cat uh, by Blake Snyder, and so really reading Save the Cat um, transformed my writing process because it gave me a template that you know you can shift to suit your own needs. And it helped me when I was stuck. And now I, I teach in several MFA writing programs and I make my students read uh, Save the Cat. So that's what's changed for me. Instead of free writing, I don't have time. So I, I outlined and create a beat sheet. I am what thriller writers call a pencer. And what that means is I write by the seat of my pants. I literally live the story with the characters. I have no idea how it's going to end unless I'm writing a historical novel where I do know the historical outcome. But I don't know how the characters get there. And so I feel my way along letting the characters lead the story. But in terms of my writing style, I'm a bricklayer. And what I mean by that is every paragraph has to be right before I proceed to the next paragraph. I'm laying bricks. This is the foundation. This is the next level. This is the next level. And I mean, my case is the way I write because it takes me three times as long to finish a book. So if I'm writing the draft of one of our co-authored books, he gets really frustrated. But nonetheless, when I finish mine, it is not a vomit and mop session. <laughs> it is basically done. <laughs> yeah. And over the years, you know, we've made a pretty in-depth study of writing and the writing process. I mean, one of the reasons we love going to Thriller Fest in New York is where else can, you know, and we always sign up for Craft Fest, which raises eyebrows periodically, but where else can you go and listen to your peers talk for an hour solid on the writing process? And what we have come to understand is that the one great immutable law about writing is that there's no great immutable law about writing and each and every one has to figure out for themselves what works. Amen. I just wanna remind folks really quickly that um, we are going to uh, start taking questions from the audience. So if you have one, please type it into the Q&A box. Sorry, Johnny, I stepped on you there. Uh, I was just agreeing. <laughs> So I did want to um, jump in with a couple of audience questions. Um, the first is from Joanna, who wants to know, um, how has the pandemic affected your writing? 
I can go first this time since I've never gone first. And I, I, I can tell you that the pandemic did me no favors. Okay. Uh, it messed up my writing in, in a, in a fairly negative way. Uh, for the first few months of the shutdown, the quarantine, I couldn't concentrate. I don't know if this was common for folks, but I tried to read, I would read a little bit. I just, I just couldn't concentrate very well. And I tend to do my, my writing in coffee shops. I, I like, you know, listening to people's conversations. I just like being around people. Uh, when I'm in this office that you can see behind me, I often tend to be like, oh, maybe I need to arrange, rearrange the books or, you know, do something here, or this needs cleaning. And so when, when all coffee shops were closed down here in the Denver area for 10 months, it, it was rough for me. We've now opened up, and so I'm starting to get back in the rhythm. But but the pandemic most certainly affected me in a pretty rough way. I know others found it great, but uh, not the pandemic, but but just the enforced solitude. But but I, I certainly didn't. Um, you know, as as a newspaper journalist, you know, I had to file stories in in, in terrible conditions stuff like that. So, and, and you, you got people screaming at you or when you're working at the desk in the office, you know, you got editors here and editors here all yelling at you. So I, I was kind of used to that, but that was a long time ago. Uh, past 23 years, I've been in, in this office sitting down writing. And when I tell people, you know, I'm used to being alone. And I think I write a lot better when I'm alone. What I'm not used to is having a son finish high school in the den and then start college in the den, and a wife who's a realtor working uh, at the office at the dining room table. So that was a big, um, uh, tough break. I mean, that was that that was tougher. But it's but it's it's not that tough. I mean, my son had a, a whole lot harder. He loses his senior year and his first semester in freshman as in college. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm not complaining at all. And I had I had book contracts. So, you know, I, I was still able to make a living. So that's, that's the great thing about this. Yeah, it, we loved it. It was a blessing for us. Um, all of the, the conferences were canceled. All the social events were canceled. Every place that they wanted us to go speak had canceled. So we just sat down and we went to work. Uh, and we, we, I, in particular, really needed it because uh, Simon and Schuster censored one of my novels that I was working on the the the, uh, the sequel for, and I've never been shut down like that in my life. I mean, it was the most terrifying thing that has I've ever endured in in my entire thirty five careers as an author. And so, when the pandemic hit, and our editor at, at DOS said, "Yeah, just." Don't do that. Write another Donovan book instead. I mean, I, I just sat down and what, turned that out in a month and a half, about 150,000 words. So for me, the pandemic was was great. You know, and, and for me, I am by nature an introvert who prefers solitude. Mike and I spent 28 years living on a Buffalo ranch seven miles from the next closest house. So I have always written in isolation and done my best work there. It's just that with the uh, pandemic, I was enforced. So I couldn't go out and have a beer at the One-Eyed Buffalo in Thermopolis, Wyoming. I had to stay home and actually sit in front of the keyboard, which I did. I have a question here from Grace, who wants to know, how does the American West shape the characters within your writing? I'll go first. There we go. The American go West, <laughs> the landscape in a Western is always a character. So the landscape speaks, the landscape lives, the landscape interacts with your characters in a way that, it, I'm sure it does in other genres, but it seems more so in a novel that's set in the frontier. And so the, the landscape itself shapes everything you write. Yeah, I'm going to follow and hold up dissolution again, because this is a story about an archaeological field crew going up into the Wind River Mountains, and the, the end of the world comes. And for Sam Delgado, he's, he's a graduate student from New York. Uh, he grew up in, on Long Island. 
And all of a sudden, he it, it's the landscape, it's the, the, the challenges, it's the wildlife, it's the people, it's the archaeology that completely refocuses his character and allows him to discover just who he is as a human being and face the kind of moral dilemmas he's going to have to face. I can uh, piggyback on that as well. Um, so for me, I, you know, I, I very much agree with what you guys just said. Uh, for me, the landscape of the American West obviously centered upon the Rosebud Indian Reservation. And, and I felt that, you know, I needed to write a, a, a novel that depicted a reservation, which I, I understand that most of my readers have never set foot on a native reservation. They may have seen one on TV. You know, um, now I have, I have a, a fair number of native readers, but, you know, I, 70,000 people, I'm sure, of my the people that bought my book have never stepped foot on a native reservation, you know. And so I, I wanted to depict what life is like on an Indian reservation because I don't think people understand that. I wanted to show sort of the, the poverty, the fact that we don't have restaurants on the reservation, 40% of our houses don't have uh, electricity or running water. Um, you know, it's, it's a very different landscape than, than I think folks are used to. And it is part of the American West. But I also put three chapters of the book in Denver, Colorado, my beloved hometown, how this has changed. Because the Denver that I grew up in some decades ago is changing. It's gentrifying the landmarks, you know, and, and so those were the most fun uh, chapters for me to write. Virgil travels from South Dakota to Denver. And so I wanted to comment upon how the American West is changing with the infusion of money, gentrification, all of these things, legal cannabis in the state of Colorado. And so, you know, I, I, I wanted to comment as well upon that. So I had a lot of fun in both of these uh, settings. Yeah, sure. I mean, the lands, landscape's a big part of it. The land is a character, like everybody says. Uh, and it's also, you know, you got people, I got, a lot of times I'm writing coming of age novels for young adults or, or you know, adults are, I got people fish out of water, people from the South who find themselves in the West and how that affects them. How do you adapt to change? How do you adapt to uh, conflict? I mean, that's, that's pretty much um, what I think most good literature is. It's about change and conflict and how we deal with it. Question here from uh, Melanie, who wants to know, how are you responding in your work to the increasing environmental threats to the West? Hmm. I think Mike should start that with dissolution. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the, the really downsides to being an anthropologist and archaeologist who has, well, Kathy and I have both spent our entire adult careers studying the collapse of cultures and writing about them, is seeing the same things beginning to happen to our own, and, and now we have worldwide culture, where what happened to the lowland Maya and to the Chaco and, and to Cahokia and to the Harappan civilization and to Ur and all of the other ones that you can go down the line is now happening to us. The climate is changing. We have a large population, seven and a half billion people who are being fed on just in time uh, inventory re food resources and the climate is changing and people are starting to, to scramble over uh, decreasing resources. So Kathy and I were asked to write dissolution specifically as our take on changing climate, on the social problems that, that we have in the country today, and what happens when it all goes wrong. And just uh, as another thing, my book, The Ice Lion that I read from, is all about global warming and what we do right and what we do wrong. Came out pretty long. I can go, Johnny, unless you want to go. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, yeah, you go. Well, you know, I, I think it's a wonderful question, and thank you to the person who submitted it. I, you know, I'm going to be honest. I didn't really address environmental threats to the West in my book, and the reason is there were so many other subjects that I needed to cover, and I didn't want the book to be sort of this dry textbook, you know, or or a catalog of, of problems. So I actually had to pull some things back. So I focus upon the broken criminal justice system on reservations, the broken healthcare system, and the problem of healthy and sustainable food, which is, you know, I suppose tangentially related. But I didn't address, you know, 
uh, some of these other issues uh, uh, directly, you know, because again, there's there's only so much you can put in here, but but it's it's a great thought, and I can't wait to read Mike and Kathy's books. The fact that they address these so directly, and a, a lot of the the uh, things that we're dealing with today, you know, we had to deal with uh, in the past too: uh, uh, droughts, uh, heat waves. Uh, Terrible winters, things like I did a novel on the 1886 uh, winter that just devastated the open range industry in, in the northern Montana and Wyoming area. Uh, so, I mean, I mean, except, you know, change again, change, whether it's in characters or whether it's in situations or in landscape and environment, it's all change and it's all about conflict. And again, that's, that's why we would like to write. This is going to be our last question for tonight, although I'm sure we could uh, I'm sure we could talk all night long. Um, the question from Mickey, who wants to know, is there a book you are afraid to write? <laughs> That's I'll a start. Good question. Yes, there is. Um, there's a, a period in American history between the, the mid 1600s and the mid 1700s that anthropologists have called the shatter zone, which is about the Native American slave trade. And Kathy and I have kicked this around time after time because it's this huge, giant, forgotten part of our American history and how our, our country actually unfolded. And the problem that we've got is we can't find anything heroic about it because it's it's heartbreaking it's heartbreaking and it, it's not just the whites but it, it's the fact that you have so many native american nations who are going out committing genocide on other native american nations so that they can feed human beings into both the, the english slave market the spanish slave market and to a, a very lesser extent the french slave market so that's one that, that Kathy and I just have never been able to, to, to juice ourselves up to write. It's just too heartbreaking. I wish somebody would though. I just want to jump in. I believe there's a scholarly book that just dealt with that. Andre, um, I forget, it starts with an R. I have it in my shelf over somewhere and he won some award about two years ago. I'm sure you're aware of it and he may, he may approach it from a different angle than you guys are. So, um, Anyway, yeah. David, the, the best reference that I can give you is uh, from Chicasa to Chickasaw by Dr. Robbie Ethbridge, and it's a University of Mississippi press book where, I mean, she, she just does it eth ethnographically, and it's, it's just, it's marvelous. It'll just leave you in tears. Well, I'll quickly follow that and say the book that I am afraid to write, and I've been working on it for a while, um, is uh, sort of my memoir project, Creative Nonfiction. I received a grant from the organization PEN America to write about the mass incarceration of American Indians, which involves some of my own family. Um, and, and so I've tried to write about this. My, uh, my auntie and my cousin were murdered uh, on the, the Rosebud uh, Reservation. And um, you know, this is some subject matter that's fairly dark, and I, I have not really been able to find a way to get around it that I'm comfortable sharing with the world, but maybe in a few years. I'm afraid every time I sit down and start writing. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm just afraid that, you know, it's going to suck or I'm not going to be able to do it. So, yeah, I'm, I'm scared about every, every book I, I write. It's kind of semi-related uh, years ago um i had pitched an, an idea to my agent and she sold the idea and we had the title was, was the guy's name was going to be mckinnon um and i told him here's what i want to write i want to write about this guy and, and the union officer and post-civil war texas he goes down to mexico gets involved in the uh the, the waristas and, and and all that and then um it ends with just a a, a sam peck and paul style bloodbath on this uh, beautiful beach on, on the western coast of Mexico. She goes, go for it. So, so I'm starting to write this book. I've got maybe a chapter or two in it. And then um, I'm actually on a, on a magazine assignment uh, in a beautiful Colorado uh, guest ranch where um, they got Pendleton whiskey executives in to um, 
treat us all to free booze and, and, and free meals paired with this booze. Uh, it's peak season for the Aspens turning. It's beautiful. And uh, the Las Vegas massacre happens. And I'm sitting up there and, um, you know, kind of stunned. And then um, the next day, uh, I managed to talk to my wife and one of her high school friends, her son was at that concert and was shot in the head. He lived, the guy standing next to him was shot in the head and he died. So they had a skeet shooting contest for the riders there, about maybe a dozen riders there. And I had signed up for it. I've shot skeet before. Um, and I go up there and, and they say, you're gonna do it? And I said, you know what? I'm just gonna take photos. I can't hold a shotgun today. And they, nobody asked me about it. Uh, when I got home and I, I called the agent and I said, what are the chances that we can change this book? Because I can't write about a massacre right now. I wanna write about something where um, uh, nobody gets killed violently. Um, and she says, well, we, we, can, we can do something like that. Um, I have to call the publisher. She got the okay from the publisher. And uh, we, we had to keep the title because we'd already sent the title into the copyright office. So I just, I just changed the book. Um, so, you know, publishers can work with you sometimes when you, when you get into a bind like that. So sometimes I think, do I really want to go back and write that massacre novel? But I'm scared to. David, I think the book you were, you were talking about was called The Other Slavery. Andre Ressande. That's right. I think is the, I'm probably butchering his last name, but yeah, right. that was the, the book. I remember reading about it when it came out. It's fascinating. Well, I just want to thank everyone for being here with us tonight. And I want to thank your, our, our wonderful writers. Thank you all, David and Johnny and Mike and Kathy. We really appreciate your sharing your thoughts with us, your writing with us. Um, and we hope that Soon we'll be able to have you back in person at the uh, at the Writers Museum in the coming months. But thank you all so much for for being here with us. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Allison. Our pleasure. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you.